Hi everybody, how are you doing? Welcome back to the Spoogly channel. Now in this video, I want to talk about an internet horror mystery ARG thing that's been blowing up on a little underground app known as TikTok recently. The analog horror series is called the Thompson Family Extension and it's pretty crazy, I'm not even gonna lie. This is probably one of the coolest pieces of media that I've ever seen come out of TikTok. Because let's be real, nothing cool ever comes out of it. So if you enjoy strange crimes, weird liminal space pictures, plot twists, and kind of a backrooms-esque horror, then you're really gonna like this series. And if you're a sucker for a bunch of lore, you know, as I always say, the more lore, the better. Ah, I think you're really gonna enjoy this series if you like all that stuff. It was seriously so fun to watch through. If you have not seen the original videos, there's four of them so far. They're about two minutes each. Check them out right now. Then come back to this video, but I do recommend you watching it first. Now, if you saw from TikTok, you might not know that there are four parts, because I think the first part is the one that blew up. So after some digging, I found the other parts, and we'll get into them in this video. So without any more blabbering on, let's get into the analog horror series known as the Thompson Family Extension. So I'm briefly going to talk about the story and the disappearance of the Thompson family and kind of just give a broad overview of the first episode. Part one begins with the only available picture we have of the Thompson family. And in the picture, you can see a mother, a father, and then two daughters. All of these people are unnamed as of right now. We just know that they're the Thompsons. And this picture is them posing for some kind of like family or church photo shoot. Now the family apparently is in some deep doo-doo with the IRS because when they disappeared, they were being hunted and, you know, searched for due to tax evasion. Uh, based? The way people figured out that the Thompson family was missing is one night, the police were called to their house. They were called because their neighbor heard, quote, keening sounds coming from the house. Now, if you're not a walking dictionary, you might not know what the word keening is, but I'm here to tell you. Don't worry. So historically, the word keening is a yelling or wailing in distress of the loss of a loved one. It's kind of like a way to grieve. Specifically, the word keening was used a lot in Celtic culture, and it was used in kind of a ritualistic ceremony. When they would lose a loved one, they would keen and they would they'd scream and cry and wail about the loss of their, their loved one. So that's what the neighbors of the Thompsons heard from inside their house. Anyways, the police were obviously worried about a family member screaming and crying, so they broke down the door to search the house and to see what was going on. They walk inside the house and they look around and the first thing they really notice is how weirdly laid out and decorated everything here is. There's weird furniture, weird objects on tables, and just a strange aura and vibe to the entire thing. Now keep in mind, this takes place in the early 80s and late 70s, so it's got this like older architecture that you know we're not used to now, but it looks weird. Like there's some weird stuff going on. The cops obviously still searching for whoever was making that sound. They clear the first floor. Uh, there's nobody there. So then they go downstairs to the den down there and they start searching around as well. And at first they thought that the downstairs was empty too. They didn't see anything until they saw a massive curtain on a wall behind one of the couches. Now, usually there's not massive curtains in an underground basement because there's, there's no windows. So they were pretty freaked out, pretty weirded out. And because of this, they decided to rip open the curtain and look right behind it to see what could be back there. And to their shock and slight horror, they found a hidden room. Now, next, the cops did what cops do, and they retrieved the house blueprints, you know, the house layout, uh, the plans, and they checked to see if this room was there. Like, was it built into the house? And it was not. So now they have another crime that the Thompsons have committed besides evading taxes for the IRS. They now have illegally expanded their home underground without getting the proper paperwork based. So this hidden room behind the curtain ended up being just another den type area with some couches and some weird hallways and stuff. Nothing too crazy yet. And the cops thought it ended here. You know, the Thompsons built another room, a secondary living room, maybe. Not that crazy. I mean, yeah, it's kind of weird, but it's not that bad. That is until after a while of searching, they noticed a small hallway that led on to other rooms. 
and then more rooms, and then more rooms past that. These rooms kept leading through small corridors and small openings to other dens, to other living rooms, to other hallways, eventually expanding into giant, seemingly never-ending spaces, all of which had lighting, were furnished, were, you know, heated and cooled, and it was like the inside of a house just ever expanding. Since the cops didn't want to go any deeper into the labyrinth and get lost and never be seen again, they went back to the downstairs of the house to regroup and to, to gather what the heck they just saw. After this initial search by the police, they called in some specialists and some other people to attempt to go down into the extension, as they were calling it, to map it out, to explore it, to see, you know, how did seemingly a family of four build this this labyrinth and structure underneath the house and how does it seemingly go on forever it, it, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense here you know so the cops are freaked out they got some people down there to, to help and that's where the video ends now as of right now the full extent of this maze is unknown and even the people that have searched it and gone through it have sadly not done anything because you'll, you'll see why i'm not going to spoil it yet but it's crazy. The only reason people even kept searching around it is because ever so often they heard the bellowing and screaming bouncing off the walls from deep inside of the extension. Which, of course, you know, you hear somebody screaming down there, you, you want to go help them, right? Like, surely. And that's what these people want to do. Not a good idea, though. And that's where the video ends. On to part two. Now, part two introduces us to a new character in the story, which is a reporter that has been tasked with, you know, photographing the extension, photographing this labyrinth and structure, taking pictures for the press and for the report for the police. This reporter's name is Linda Meyer or Mayor. I think it's Meyer, though. Linda and her team were tasked with exploring this place, mapping it out, taking pictures and whatnot. After getting through several different rooms and several different kilometers of exploring this labyrinth, this extension, and taking pictures, Linda and her team eventually stumbled upon a weird room. Now, this place is what she has nicknamed the Playroom, and it hadn't been searched prior to this. Now, she and her team are the first people there checking it out. This playroom really messed up Linda, like psychologically it did. She, she photographed it like she was supposed to, but this room just filled her with this just sense of dread, this horrifying nightmare feeling that she couldn't shake. Feeling really, you know, unsettled, Linda, you know, called back her team and they got out of the extension and then she hoped that this empty, just dreadful feeling would go away when she distanced herself from she said when she was in there, she felt like something was watching her from the shadows around. The feeling of a presence being there just hovered over her constantly, and it really like messed her up. She claimed when she got back home, she had nightmares of being stuck in the playroom. But not being stuck as an adult. No, you know, she was a baby in the dream. And in this dream, well, this nightmare, I guess, she was crawling around helplessly inside the playroom, unable to do anything, thinking that something's in the shadows chasing her. It was really, you know, bad for her mental health, obviously. She claimed that the fear of an unknown presence in the darkness was scarier than being stuck in the playroom itself. Like, it got to the point where she just wanted to be stuck in the playroom if there was no something in the darkness. But she so definitely thought there was something that it really, really freaked her out. After months of experiencing these dreams and these nightmares, Linda could barely have a differentiation between real life and the dream. The line between reality and fake blended together, and eventually she was diagnosed with fatal insomnia, which is where you die because you can't sleep. This disease has no cure, and eventually, because of this, Linda passes away at age 25 in 1983. Rest in peace, Linda. So yeah, you heard that right. You know, this woman goes to photograph a specific room in the extension. She takes pictures of it, and it literally messes her mind up so bad by wondering what's around in the darkness that she just had this overwhelming fear of death and macabre and decay and horror, and it never left her. Even when she tried to sleep, it could not escape her mind. She was trapped in her own delusion, and it killed her. Sorry, it despawned her, guys. And that is where part two ends, and where part three begins. So part three introduces us to another character named Alexander Mercer, who is a geospatial engineer that was, again, tasked with mapping out a comprehensive map 
of the extension. So that way people could go in and search and not get lost. He was tasked to do this in 1982, about a year before Linda Meyer died. This photo you're seeing right now was taken three years before he had this surgery, which I'm going to talk about and you'll see why he gets the surgery. But the surgery is named the buccal cavity ablation, which is a very disturbing surgery. And let's get into why he got it. Pretty much it's a fancy way of saying mouth surgery. So during his mapping exercise with his team, Alex actually ended up getting separated from his crew. I bet you can see where this is going. The section where him and his crew were at was known as the basins, which are pretty much these pool-like structures in the labyrinth and hallways that seemingly are full of water at varying depths. Most of these pools and basins are about, you know, swimming pool size, so it's not too crazy. You can you, know, you can get in and get out, but a lot of them are so deep and like the walls are too high where you can't climb out. So if you fall in, you know, there's no step ladder to get out. You're stuck. And that's exactly what Alex did. The basin that Alex fell in was estimated to be about 16 football fields deep and wide. So this is a big one. Also, anything but the metric system. Red, white, and blue. Anyways, Alex fell in this massive basin and his team didn't notice at first. And a full 24 hours later, they followed his cries for help and they found him and they threw a rope down and pulled him out and they, they rescued him. He lived. Not for long, though. After 24 hours of treading water in this giant basin where he could not see the bottom, like it was full of water and he couldn't see what was under him, he was freaking out the entire time. There was darkness surrounding him. He had no lights. He was alone in this body of water, in this labyrinth and structure. He was toast, he thought. But after getting out of the extension, he developed a severe case of hydrophobia, which, of course, if you didn't pay attention in chemistry class, is the irrational fear of water. Now, Alex's case was a little bit crazier because he literally was deathly afraid of his own saliva. That's right, his own saliva. Every liquid possible freaked him out. It wasn't just water, it was every liquid. He wouldn't shower, he wouldn't drink water, he wouldn't go near lakes, he, he hated his saliva in his mouth, and it all stemmed from being stuck in that pool. In a desperate attempt to fix this fear, Alex contacted an underground surgeon to perform a disgusting surgery on him so he wouldn't have to worry about the saliva anymore. The uh, surgery, of course, being the removal of Alex's mouth. He, he wanted to cut his mouth out completely. The surgery would effectively seal his mouth shut like in the esophagus like a piece of skin would be taped over or like you know surgically put over it and uh, he would never eat again see alex thought that he could get a food tube installed through his stomach and be fed that way so he wouldn't have to deal with his own saliva yeah that's absolutely disgusting i'm gonna be honest i probably probably should have put a warning at the beginning of the video the procedure ended successfully which was good and until 10 hours later when his body began to reject the modifications completely his body was like, yeah, yeah, no, you're not, you're not shutting my mouth up. Yeah, you're crazy. After this, his body began to rapidly deteriorate, eventually drying him out of all liquids and kind of like sucking him up like a prune. This is the final picture of Alexander Mercer taking 16 hours after the surgery to get his mouth sewn shut. And that is where part three ends. Yeah, part three ramped it up in the horror body horror aspect of it. It's, it's pretty, pretty scary, I'm going to say. But you can kind of see the correlation of these specific rooms that these people are finding correlating with a specific disease or sickness or, you know, self-torture that they get. You know, Linda was in the playroom where it was dark and you couldn't see out in front of you very far and she got haunted in dreams because of that. Alex was in these basins of water where you couldn't see the bottom and you didn't know where you were and you couldn't get out and he began being afraid of water. It makes sense, I guess. Doesn't make any sense at all. But yeah, that's the end of part three. And that leads us to the final part that we have right now, which is part four. So part four is entitled Ectomorphic Fusion Syndrome, which is crazy. It kind of sounds like a bad villain from a movie. And it introduces us to another victim. I mean, character. Siobhan Donahue is her name. This takes place four years after Alex's untimely passing. And it begins with Siobhan and six other people as part of a missionary crew going to the Thompson house to just get the spiritual vibe of it to kind of understand the religious or perhaps spiritual implications of what was happening in the extension. I'm pretty sure you don't need a missionary to tell you that this is a bad place, but more power to you. So within the extension, there are a ton of drapes and curtains and doorways 
that always lead to other places that look the same. You can rip back a curtain and you'll see just another den or another room or another set of hallways or stuff like that. But Siobhan and her crew found one specific curtain that really just confused them. This curtain instilled them with this empty void feeling that they couldn't shake. They felt as if if they ripped the curtain open to see what was behind it, they would be completely devolved into nothingness, apparate into a void, if you will. Once the group found this curtain, they kind of huddled up and they started praying and just trying to get the vibe of the spiritual you know, realm there. And that didn't last long because Siobhan said, quote, the extension is devoid of God, end quote. And like I said, she was filled with this eternal emptiness, a chasm that couldn't be filled with anything. And after leaving the extension, it never went away. She was eventually diagnosed with this video's title, Ectomorphic Fusion Syndrome, which is a rare brain disorder when the infected person presumes themselves to be empty due to experiencing a large void or experiencing some traumatic event where there was absolutely nothing. That's what normal people experience. But you see, Siobhan just saw that curtain and had that dread feeling. She didn't really see a void, she just kind of felt it. And because of this, she felt so empty, so half full. So like It was almost like nothing of her was left. She was a husk. So after that diagnosis, she began doing anything she could to fill up that void. And it started with you know simple things like overeating and gaining weight. She was shoving anything she could into her mouth to fill the void. Nothing was working. After this, it became a little bit darker because Siobhan began to get body modifications inside of herself, like plastic surgery, to fill the void again. All of this making her less human and more just plastic and metal. Eventually, the empty feeling never went away and she could not put enough stuff inside of herself to fill that void that was there. Even though there was, there was no void, it was in her head, but she tried so hard to fill the void with everything. It just wasn't working. About six months after she left the extension, Siobhan became extremely erratic and extremely like hostile, probably because she was, you know, fat and had plastic surgery everywhere and, and looked like a, a blob. And eventually she disappeared from her family. A few months after this, her family was downstairs extending their basement a little bit, you know, not in the extension way, just, you know, doing normal home remodel stuff. This, this isn't crazy. They were just doing remodels when they smelt a really disgusting smell from the crawl space. And upon investigating it, the dad discovered where Siobhan went and he found a disgusting and horrible display. Like if you have any gripe with bodily harm and stuff, you might want to skip this. This is disgusting. Siobhan was in the crawl space, gruesomely and Jerry Wrigley fused together with the house's water pipe and sewage pipe right into her esophagus. So she had taken all the pipes in the crawl space and fused them into her body. That way she could absorb infinite amounts of stuff to fill the void. This is the final picture ever taken of Siobhan Donahue. And it's, it's disgusting. Like she has become one with the house trying to fill herself up fully. And that is how part four ends. So much like the other characters in the story, this character went down there, saw a specific part that messed her up. She experienced something that we can't understand. She left the extension, got back to reality, but she was still left with that empty void feeling like something was missing and she just couldn't find what that something was. We can only hope that that something was death because she's dead. So I'm just going to summarize everything I said. That way I don't sound like a madman. The Thompson family went missing and their house was searched. In the basement of their house was a secret room behind a curtain which led to more and more rooms and then more and more rooms and then more and more rooms eventually sprawling out into an infinite hellscape like the back rooms kind of. This hellscape would come to be known as the extension. Teams and people were dispatched to search this extension to map it out, you know, and to see what in the world's going on down there. And each time someone was exposed to a different part of the extension, they also were exposed to a different psychological effect that turned them into a completely different entity, a completely different being. Linda Meyer, Alexander Mercer, and Siobhan Donahue were the characters we met so far in these parts all of which contracted different disorders after leaving the extension and eventually succumbed to the effects that these disorders gave them. These disorders were not normal, as you can tell, no normal person fuses themselves with their house's waste pipe. But all of it was because of the psychological torment the extension put on them. As of recording this, we're in the middle of the series, we have no idea why this is happening. Could it be, you know, aliens? Could it be 
the Thompsons losing their minds and building this place somehow, and that's that's why they were evading taxes, they had to pay for it? Or did a different reality like melt together with our reality, and the entrance just so happens to be in the basement of the Thompsons' house? I don't know the answers, but all I can tell you is to not explore or venture to the Thompson family extension. If you want to keep your life, your mouth, or your body normal, you're welcome. So yeah, that was the ARG. It blew up on TikTok. Wanted to make a video on it to get it out there so everybody could get kind of the story in a long form format. You know, TikTok's only so good because it's a short form, but hope y'all enjoyed this lore. If there are more parts, I'm sure there will be, I will make a part two to this. I just wanted to go ahead and get this out for everybody who is interested. And if you are, I hope you enjoyed. Hope you enjoyed this format. Um, I, I do videos like this all the time. You can check out my channel if you want. I really do like the story. It's very liminal and backrooms esky, very psychological torment. Right, right up my alley. Yay. Thank you for watching this. Hope you enjoyed it. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Make sure you tell somebody you love them because life is too short not to. With all that said, I'll catch you later. Peace.